passage that we're going to be looking at tonight is dealing with the subject of spiritual revival. The man that wrote this, the human author, is a man by the name of Korah. He was reflecting on God's people and the fact that God had revived them back from Egypt and brought them into, um, into a covenant community with him. With him. But he's looking at the people of Israel at this point. He was realizing that they were there was spiritual, serious spiritual problems, and in fact, he saw them as being under the judgment of God. And he prays this prayer: "Will you not revive us again?" This passage really has to do with biblical revival. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever felt We'll start this way. Have you ever felt physically drained? Like you're just sapped of energy? How about emotionally drained? If you're physically drained, it is very likely that the problem is that you have not received the right level of nutrients for the amount of, of effort or exercise that you're putting forth. In other words, your exercise and your effort are beyond what your level of nutrients that you're taking in. That's the problem more than likely. And the same can be the case for us spiritually. We can go through times of spiritual dryness, of spiritual fatigue, where we are worn out spiritually. And the reason that that occurs is because of the same reason that we would be physically fatigued. It's because we're not receiving the right kind of spiritual nutrients anymore. Many people throughout church history have prayed for and desired biblical spiritual revival. Of course, there have been many counterfeits. There's a book by the name of Ian, uh, uh, written by the name of Ian Murray. He wrote a book called Revival or Revivalism. It is an excellent book that explains the difference between revival, true biblical revival, which happened, for example, in the first Great Awakening, and revivalism, which primarily happened in the second Great Awakening. What we want to see here biblically is what true biblical revival is. A man by the name of R.A. Of, of Torrey wrote this in his book on prayer. He said, many pray for revival. That certainly is a prayer that is, that is pleasing to God. It is along the line of his will, but many prayers for revivals are purely selfish. The churches desire revivals in order that the membership may be increased in order that the church may have a position of more power and influence in the community, in order that the church treasury may be filled, in order that, the, that a good report may be made to the presbytery or conference or association. For such low purposes as these, churches and ministers oftentimes are praying for a revival, and oftentimes, too, God does not answer the prayer. Why should we pray for a revival? For the glory of God. Because we cannot endure it that God should continue to be dishonored by the worldliness of the church, by the sins of unbelievers, by the proud unbelief of the day, because God's word is being made void in order that God may be... I am hearing myself in that. that. Can somebody please shut that door? Thank you. That's a bit distracting. Uh, Let me pick up again here. Why should we pray for revival? For the glory of God, because we cannot endure it that that God should continue to be dishonored by the worldliness of the church, by the sins of unbelievers, by the proud unbelief of the day, because God's word is being made void, in order that God may be glorified by the outpouring of his spirit on the church of Christ. For these reasons, first of all, and above all, we should pray for revival. Many a prayer for the Holy Spirit is a purely selfish prayer. Now with that in mind, and as we begin to look at Psalm 85, we really want to ask the question, how does God revive his people? What is is Korah praying here, and, and how does revival begin to happen in the life of an individual or in the life of God's people? And I want to begin by pointing this out, number one. That we need that, that revival happens when God's people recognize the spiritual conditions for revival. 
Now, here's what I mean. If you look at verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3, if you look at these verses, you're going to see a, a, a very, uh, the same phrase used over and over again. It says in verse 1, twice, you have. You have been favorable. Again, it says, you have brought back the captivity of Jacob. It says in verse 2, you have forgiven the, in the iniquity. It says again, you have covered all your sins. It says again in verse 3, you have taken away. And again it says, you have turned from the fierceness of your anger. You have, you have, you have, you have. What is necessary for revival is for us to get back to realizing just exactly all that God has done. To really take time to think and to meditate upon how good God is, and what God has really done in our lives. A person who is truly revived, a true person who is truly spiritually revived, is going to be full and ready to express all of the good things that God has done for him. Korah goes through several here. First of all, a person who is experiencing revival will recognize the very favor of God. Look at verse 1 again. It says in verse 1, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. The favor of God, we know it in the, first, in, in, the, in the New Testament, is grace. That is what favor is. It's unmerited favor. That's grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, he has, he, he has said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that was a time where the Apostle Paul was under great duress. He was experiencing his thorn in the flesh. He had recounted all the times that he was persecuted and sick and under, under great suffering. And he says, his testimony is, God's grace, Christ's grace has been sufficient for him. We need to realize, even if we, as we look back at 2020, that God's been good, that God's been faithful, that God has sustained us. We, I've heard so much, frankly, about how horrible 2020 has been and how awful it's been and how it, I ho I, 20, 2021 has to be better and how crazy it's been. And it has been crazy. I don't know if it's really been awful, but it's been crazy. I, I'll, I'll give... I'll give them that much. But has not, can you not see God's faithfulness in 2020? Can you not see God's sustaining grace in 2020? Can't you see him and his gospel work in your life in 2020? Can't you see what he has done? Korah is looking at all that God has done for the nation of Israel, and he, I think what's happening is here, is he's beginning to experience spiritual revival himself. He looks at all that God has done, and he wants it for his people. And we begin to experience spiritual revival when we really take time to think about how, all, how faithful God is, how good God is. We see, secondly, that he's been faithful. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You've been faithful to do that. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 22 through 23 say, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God has been faithful. In verses 2 through 3, we see another something else that God has done for his people, and he's done the same thing for his people in the New Testament church as well. Verse 2, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Should we not be thankful not only for the grace of God, not only for the faithfulness of God, but should we not be thankful for the forgiveness of God? I don't care how hard it was for us in 2020. I guarantee you we sinned. Many, many times. And yet, if you think about Christ and his grace and his forgiveness, it really doesn't matter how hard things were. You can always be thankful for God's forgiveness in your life, can't you? Can't we? And Korah says, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. 
He's recognizing the grace of God, the faithfulness of God, the forgiveness of God. And no doubt, all of the things that Korah is saying about the nation of Israel are true for his New Testament people as well. And really, even more so. We see the faithfulness of God even more than they do in the Old Testament. His grace even more, and certainly his forgiveness even more. If we are going to experience spiritual revival, then we are, we are going to have to understand and, and think about and meditate and be grateful for all of those things that God has given to us. And this is absolutely necessary and important. He says, verse 3, you have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Now, then we see the next, the next part of this. Now, I'll just pause and say one more thing about this. David says in Psalm 40, verses 1 through 2, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. God's, God, David, he says, you've established me. Now here's the question. What is keeping you from recognizing God's working in the past? Do you know what often keeps us from recognizing God's working in the past? One, one possibility is bitterness. There is a root of bitterness in your heart. God hasn't done something the way that you expected him to or that you wanted him to or Somebody else has hurt you or harmed you in some way that, that you haven't, haven't dealt with, and there's bitterness, and that bitterness is keeping you from really being grateful for what God has done for you. It might be an unforgiving spirit. It might be jealousy, or it may just be plain old pride. I mean, if we're not thankful for the forgiveness of God, I, it, it's because of our pride. Because if it, in humility, we realize how often we sin. And in, and in humility, we realize how often we're forgiven for our sin. So we need to ask that question. And that is one of the things we've got to look and see how good God has been. Now, when we get to verse 4, we have this prayer now. This request, where Korah says in verse 4, Restore us, O God, of our salvation. The word restore there means to turn. He says, would you turn us? Would you restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause, um, uh, cause your anger toward us to cease? Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you re not revive us again? He says, Lord, would you not turn us? Now, the question then in the passage is, turn us from what? Well, we see from the passage, he says, will you be angry forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Now, just think for a minute, why is it that God's people, uh, why would God turn his anger toward his people? Think in the Old Testament. When did that happen? There was, I think somebody said, it, there is, there is one, one sin that really caused God to do this over and over and over again, and that is idolatry. And we keep talking about that on Sunday nights in the book of Daniel. And I mention it again because it is something that is obviously here in this, in this psalm and throughout the Old Testament. God turns his anger toward his people when there is idolatry. When there are something that is preoccupying, that takes the place of God, that when we wake up in the morning, we want to pursue that rather than God. That is idolatry. And he says, would you not turn us? Turn us from what? Turn us, I think, turn us from idolatry. Would you not restore us, turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease? Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? And then he says this, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? What, is it, what does it mean to, to experience spiritual revival? What is biblical revival? It is rejoicing in God. Rejoicing in the God of revival. 
He wants us to turn, to turn from our idolatry, to turn from our sin. In Ezekiel 14, we've heard of that passage before where we have idols of the heart. And and in verse 6 of this passage, it tells us that it, it, it requests, will you not revive us again? Why? That your people may rejoice in you. So the first step for us in truly experiencing spiritual revival is to recognize all that God has done for us. His forgiveness, his faithfulness, all of that. But the next step is really to turn from all those things that we have been looking to and to turn to our God and to learn to rejoice in him, to learn to joy in him. My mind immediately goes to Psalm 1. You remember Psalm 1? Blessed is the man that delights in the law of the Lord. He enjoys God. Throughout the Psalms, you see this over and over again. The psalmist will say, I delight to be in your presence. I delight to know you, to enjoy you. Can I ask you a question, brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you enjoy God? You will not experience spiritual revival if you fail to enjoy God. Spiritual revival, when he prays, revive us again, on the heels of that, he says what? That your people will rejoice in you. He sees that there is a way and there is a place for God's people to really enjoy God and to rejoice in God. And that is how we experience spiritual revival. Romans 5.11 says, Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Job 27, 10 through 11 says, Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? I will teach you by the hand of God that which is the, that with the Almighty will I not conceal. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. God desires that, that we delight in him, that we enjoy him. In Nehemiah chapter 8, in verses 5 and 6, and in verses 9 through 10, the people are on the brink of spiritual revival. They have ingested the word of God as they have heard it explained and read. And then it says in those passages, the joy of the Lord is your strength. These people in Nehemiah are spiritually revived. God wants this for his people. Verse 7, it says, Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. It is interesting that that this is something that, that is a prayer. It is something that God has to do for us. Did you know that? If you say to yourself, I am just going to somehow muster up some sort of will to joy God. I'm just going to do it. You know, you can't enjoy God in your flesh. You can't enjoy God just by mustering up the will to do so. The way that you enjoy God is for God to increase your desire in him. Now, you can get rid of your idols. That helps. You you have an involvement in in, in this. It's not as though, okay, I could just do whatever I want and enjoy all the things that I want and, and pursue with all my heart all kinds of idols, and I don't know why I don't enjoy God. There is involvement in, uh, in, uh, in, in this, but ultimately what we need to do, when we come to a realization that we don't really enjoy God the way that God wants us to, we need to get on our knees and ask God to give us that enjoyment. Do you think that that is the kind of prayer that God would love to answer 
I mean, think about it. Not, Lord, would you get me out of this tr- problem? Would you help me with this thing? Would you solve this problem for me? Lord, would you just give me a desire to enjoy you? I am really quite convinced that a sincere prayer of that kind, God is very soon going to, re- going to uh, respond in positively toward that. So he prays for this. Now, we then pick up in verses 6 through 13, and now we're going to begin to see, well, actually really picking up in verse 8, 8 through 13, we see the experiences of revival. The experiencing, we, we see what, what it's like to experience the blessings of revival. When you truly enjoy God on a consistent basis, when you have put away your idols, when you're faith, thinking about the faithfulness of God and you are grateful for the, the forgiveness of God and all of those things, when that begins to happen in your life and in your heart, then there are four results we find in this passage in verses 8 through 13. The first result we find in verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak what? Peace. He'll speak peace. Spiritual revival brings us to a place. Now, peace is not something that you can pursue. Peace is a byproduct of enjoying God. Oh, Lord, give me the peace. No, wrong prayer. Lord, help me to enjoy you, and then you get the peace. Lord, help me to rejoice in you, and then peace comes. Peace is a result of... See, when when we really enjoy God, when we're really restored in our rejoicing of who God is, when that really happens in our lives then it really does bring us to a place where we want whatever God wants. And that means that when circumstances that are not to our liking come our way, then we can, we can deal with that. Why? Because no matter what they take from us or what they do to us or what liberties we lose or whatever happens to us, you can't take away my enjoyment of God. You can't take that away. Peace comes. Number two, by the way, peace comes when you focus and enjoy on God and when you, and when you turn off the news. I, I'm just going to meddle here a little bit. There are more people that are down in the dumps after this election. The answer is just turn the news off and open your Bible. Because if, I mean, I, there's nothing great on the news. That's, I mean, honestly, every time I turn it on, I go, Okay, yeah, all right. But we can rejoice in God. And I'm not literally saying stick your head in a hole. I mean, it's fine to listen to the news every once in a while, but not too much. Rejoice in God, and he'll give you peace. Number two, divine balance. This is interesting. This is pretty amazing here when you look at the passage. Look at, look at what it does. Look at what it says here. Mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed. Let me ask you a question, parent. Do you ever struggle with having the right balance between mercy and truth? Do you ever struggle with, oh, okay, I need to lay the law down on my kid, or I need to have mercy? This says that mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Those are two things that are very different from each other too, actually. Righteousness, you get, you get righteous, somebody stands for right all the time. i got to take a stand, i got to take a stand, i got to take a stand. How can you, the person taking a stand all the time also be at peace with others? How can the person who is... Who is uh, who, has, who is a person of truth, also be a person of mercy. You can't, and I can't. That's a God thing. That's something really only God can do through us, isn't it? And when we're really rejoicing in God, when we're really having the kind of relationship that God wants us to have, when we're really enjoying God the way he wants, this is something that happens as a result in our lives. We have peace from the Lord And we have this divine balance. Mercy and truth come together. Righteousness and peace come together. 
Why? Because we are experiencing, experiencing spiritual revival. And then verse 11 says, Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. It's, so there, there's just spiritual blessing everywhere. And then verse 13, that's the third result. The fourth result is living in, the, in God's will. Look at verse 13. Righteousness will go before him, and he shall make his footsteps our pathway. We will then begin to just live in God's will the way that he wants us to. Psalm 37 says it this way, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. God wants us to enjoy him, to delight in him, and then these things are a result. These things are not to be pursued. It is God to be pursued that is to be pursued. And these things are a result of pursuing and enjoying God. So, three questions. Number one, and I want these, these are, I, I hope that these will be very personal. Number one, what is the last time, or when is the last time you took stock of what God has done for you in your life? When is the last time we've taken, we took stock of what God has done for us in our lives? I mean, just taking time to reflect. Maybe write it down. Take, well, you know, we're always thinking about, you know, I got to lose weight in 2021, and man, I do need to lose weight in 20. I gained like 10 pounds at Christmas time. My wife is a seriously good cook and baker, and she makes awesome fudge. Anyway, <clears throat> and baklava and other things. Anyway, tomorrow, right? <laughs> So we keep saying tomorrow. <laughs> I really mean it tomorrow. <laughs> anyway. But you know what? One thing we ought to do is we ought not leave 2021 and, and not look back and see God's faithfulness and take time and reflect on the faith, faithfulness of God. We really ought not look back at 2020, 20, uh, 2020 and just go, oh, that was a horrible year. We really ought not do that. Instead, we could say that was a really crazy year with a lot of curveballs, but God was faithful. And if we'll choose to do that, uh, that would be a really helpful thing, and it would be the first step to getting back to a place of spiritual revival. Number two, is God your fulfillment and satisfaction, or is someone else or something else taking the place of that? Is God your fulfillment and satisfaction? Or someone or something else. So easy that is we are we are it is so easy for us to find something else that satisfies us outside of God. Now that does not mean that God from his benevolent hand does not give us good things that satisfy us. And we can reflect on the goodness of God through what through his gifts to us. But when we start looking to the gifts for the ultimate satisfaction, we've made them an idol. We start looking to the things that God gives us and wanting them more than God. We've made them an idol. Number three, are you experiencing the blessings of spiritual revival? I mean, if you think through these, if you think through these things, are you experiencing the blessings of spiritual revival? And if not, then what's the answer? What's the answer ultimately? You ask the Lord for desire and a, a rejoicing in him. Pray the same prayer Korah prayed. Lord, for me and for your people, Lord, would you not turn me that, and revive me that I will rejoice in you again. Revive means to make alive. And we are made alive as we rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you and thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, it is uh, certainly our desire. I would certainly pray this prayer for myself and everybody in our church. 
Lord, that we would revive, you'd revive us. And that you would cause our hearts to rejoice in you. Lord, I think of this week being the very first week of the very first, the very first day, or today is the very, very first day of the first week, full week of the year. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to put to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness so that all these things can be added to us. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.